Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome to my spoiler full Dune 2 review. And before we get started, I want to plug my new Dune inspired full album. Dune Wave Odyssey with Akira the Dawn. That's right, folks. I took quotes from across all six of Frank Herbert's Dune books. I arranged them into songs. I spoke them in my Bene Gesserit voice. And Akira the Dawn turned them into absolute fucking bangers. You can listen to this album and download it on any and all of your favorite music streaming platforms. And there's a bunch of really cool Dune Wave merch available at Akira's website, uh, meaningwave.com. Check it out. You can buy it on cassette. You can buy a CD. You can get a t-shirt. You can do whatever you want, bro. You can do whatever you want. So overall, I enjoyed this film a lot more than I thought I was going to. Expectations are the mind killer. And the first part of Dune, I didn't, I didn't love it. I don't hate it, but I felt like it was lacking a lot of the weirdness that I wanted. There's a lot of things I love about it. There's a lot of things I hate about it. And I would say the same is true for part two, but overall I enjoyed it a lot more. I highly recommend you go out and see it on the biggest screen possible. Try to see an IMAX if you can. Uh, it is absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. The effects are great. The costumes, the cinematography, so many wonderful performances, a great score. The list goes on and on, okay? It's a beautiful film. Uh, and it's definitely worth your time and your money to see it in the theater. I think another reason that I enjoyed part two more than I enjoyed part one is because part one is exposition. It's setting everything up. Whereas part two gets to knock it all down. There's a lot more action and that is what makes it a lot more enjoyable for me. So of course, there are a lot of changes from the book to the movie. I mean, there has to be. First of all, this is an adaptation. You know, you can't ever really do a one-to-one -one situation. There's always gonna be some changes, but also particularly, there has to be a lot of changes because they're trying to fit 10 pounds of shit into a five pound bag and some of these changes I thought were very intelligent. Uh, I enjoyed some of the changes. They make sense for the movie. Some of the changes I am not as excited about. Um, and my, my main issue continues to be my main issue is that Dune really needs to be adapted into a like legacy high budget series. It's just so dense and so wonderful. And there's just so many moving parts that you just, you really can't fit it all into uh, two movies, even if they're three hours long, which by the way, I'm not exactly sure of the exact runtime on part two. It was a very long film, but I will have to say that it didn't feel too long. And honestly, it could have kept going and I would have been totally down for it. The pacing is really good. It's never boring. It's constantly moving. And pacing is something that's really important to me when watching a film. Like if you get your pacing right, like you've won half the battle of making a movie. And I haven't given up hope that there will be a show. I just feel like it might be, I don't know, in like 20 years or something, 20, 30 years. If there still is a Hollywood industry, <laughs> and if I'm still alive, God willing, and if the earth is still rotating and we haven't all blown each other up, uh, maybe I'm hoping within my lifetime that I will see someone create a Dune series because man, you're gonna need I don't know, at least like 10, 12 hours to tell that first book. That could be at least 
you could easily do it in 20 to 24 hours. You could have two different seasons to go over the, the first book alone. So fingers crossed. And also, I just want to preface this whole video now that we're going to get into the particulars with these are my initial thoughts after seeing the movie one time. I understand with YouTube and the way the internet works, you need to put out your opinion as fast as you can. You need to get it out there. And so that's why I'm doing this video. I really wish we could have more time to marinate. Like I need to see the movie like a couple more times. And like, I know that there's things I'm crunching on in my brain and I'll have like more nuanced thoughts once I'm able to just like fully digest it and go over it. But it's the internet and we don't have time for that. So we're just gonna fucking go. So let's start with some of the things that I loved about the film. My top favorite scene is Paul riding the sandworm for the first time. That was done so well. It's so fucking cool. It's terrifying, this situation that he's in. Um, and that part at the end where he finally gets a footing and he starts to steer it and he pulls that like that little ring up and it pulls the sandworm up and then he's finally able to see over this giant sand dune and like all these dunes spread out ahead of him i was like oh my god that's my boy he did it and it like totally reminded me of this other time where i got really emotional when i was visiting the sand dunes in Florence, Oregon that inspired Frank Herbert. I'm such a fucking nerd that I took a vacation and went to the sand dunes that Frank Herbert were inspired by. And I got a sand buggy ride through those dunes and it was like a fast as fuck sand buggy ride. And I remember getting really emotional like when we we're finally going fast and like we crested a dune. And again, you could just see all this sand for as far as far as the eye could see. It's just sand dunes. And I got emotional in that little sand buggy ride and I got emotional during this film. And so they did a really good, good job with this scene. Total, total favorite, number one. My second favorite thing in this film is Giddy Prime. We finally get to go explore Giddy Prime and we have Fade Rausa, the Na Baron. It's his birthday, they're like celebrating. He's in this gladiatorial arena where he's gonna show off for all the people what a badass he is and kill all these leftover Atreides soldiers. And just the whole fucking time we're on Giddy Prime, I was like, damn, this is cool. I love their black sun. I love how the light from this weird sun bleaches everybody white. Uh, and even like when you had the Bene Gesserits joining Margot Fenring and how their black cloaks like turned white in the sun, I was like, damn, that's cool. And then those weird ink blot liquid fireworks, I don't know what the fuck that was, loved it. All of the set designs are really cool. All of the costume designs are really cool. I really like Fade Rausa's cannibal girlfriends. Like they're not in the book, but hell yeah, they look crazy. I wanted a little bit more time. I would love to see more of them. I'm glad that we didn't because they don't need more screen time, but they were cool as fuck and I wanted to know more. And the best part of the Giddy Prime shenanigans was when you have, Fade Rausa walking down the corridor after the deal, and he runs into Lady Margot Fenring, played by Lea Sadu. Woo, that was so fucking cool. So well done from all the lightning flashes, and then the way she uses her Bene Gesserit powers, and the way she uses her voice on him, and seduces him, and brings him into her chamber, and steals his fucking seed, because the Bene Gesserit need his uh, his genetic heritage in case things, you know, because things with Paul are obviously like going fucking sideways. So they're like, well, we might need another Kwisatz Haderach. Take some of that seed over there. You got to secure that. And woo, it was so well done. I love Lady Margot Fenring in the books. I loved Lady Margot Fenring in the film. Uh, Miss Seydu did a phenomenal job. I would love to see her more. Again, I understand why we can't have more of her. Uh, and also, 
man, I was very impressed by Austin Butler. I haven't seen any of his work before. I don't think I've seen him in anything. Uh, and, you know, I've just, I just know of him. And so seeing him act for the first time, man, I was fucking impressed. He did such a great job, uh, really stole the show, man. And I even his, I know that he does his whole voice thing, like that's part of his bag of tricks as an actor, is he really likes to play with his voice. And I loved the voice he did for Fade and how it mimicked the Barons, but was still just like a little different and a little bit of its own thing, like, man. He was fantastic, so I get it. I get the hype, Austin Butler. You made a believer out of me, for sure, 100%. So now let's get into some of the changes from the book to the movie that I like and that I'm down with. One, I like Gurney Halleck killing the Beast Raban. Uh, in the book, the Emperor does it and beheads him, which is also cool as fuck. Totally cool, I don't have a problem with that. But in the context of a movie, a theatrical film, it makes so much more sense to have Brolin's character kill him. And you also give like, uh, you know, give Gurney uh, a really cool scene too. Like he, he needed that for his character. So like, I really, I love that. And I've already stated before that just, I love these actors in these roles and they continued to impress me in this part as well. So good job, guys. Another slight variation that I don't mind is Stilgar's character is a little different from the character in the book. And specifically in the movie, he serves the function of like the comedy relief because it's such a serious film and you do need that. And then in the last one, it was more like Jason Momoa uh, as Duncan Idaho. And he was kind of doing more of the comedy relief, but you know, obviously he died in the last one. So we got to have somebody else pick up the slack and Stilgar's character was chosen to do that. And I don't mind it. I think he was really funny. I mean, his, his comedic timing was super spot on, especially in that one scene where, you know, he's like, oh, buddy. And uh, Paul's like, I'm not the Lisan Al Gaib. I'm not the thing, you know, I'm just here to fight with you guys, like blah, blah, blah. And then he goes up to the guys afterwards. He's like, oh, the Mahdi is too humble to say he's the Mahdi. Like, it's like, these guys are gonna believe no matter what Paul says. Um, and that, that was really funny, I, I cracked up. So he had a lot of really good lines uh, in the movie. And here's another little fun fact about Javier Bardem as Stilgar. And I feel like the statute of limitations is out. This is from an inside scoop. I got this scoop before they even started fucking filming the first one. So it's like, it sh I should be okay to say this now, but when they were negotiating with Javier Bardem for the part of Stilgar, he said that he would agree to play this role only if they promised to have a shot of him riding a sandworm into battle. And they were like, done, sir, done. No problem. And so I've been waiting for a really long time to see if they would hold up their end of the bargain. And watching part two, when they finally get to the battle sequence at the end, there is 100% shots of Stilgar riding a sandworm into battle. And I was like, dying laughing inside. Like I was cracking up so hard. I was like, yes, he got his fucking shot. Like so sick, so funny, totally loved it. Moving on to another change from the book to the movie that I enjoy, Florence Pugh as Irulan. Irulan's character is a lot more active in this one. She's less of a pawn and I have no hate for it. I like it, it makes sense. Um, she, she did a fantastic job in the role. I originally had said I would rather see Anna Taylor Joy in this role, just because she looks more like Irulan from the book, but Florence did a great job, I love her. She's a really great actress, so I don't have any hate for it. Next, I don't mind Paul killing the Baron in the books his little baby sister, Alia, which we'll talk about more in a minute. She's the one who gets the Baron 
And in this film, he takes the Baron down. And again, that he closes the circle. It makes total sense as a story, uh, as a movie. The Baron killed his dad. He kills the Baron. Love it. Print it, ship it, no problem. Side note, I just wanna say, Chalamet stepped it up this time, and I appreciate it, because I really, I wasn't sold on him in the first one. He looks the part, but I wasn't, I wasn't feeling his acting as much. It was a little touch and go. And I really felt like in this movie, he definitely like took it up a level or two or three, and I was like, okay, okay, Chalamet, like, I, I see you. He did a good job. So especially after he took that water of life, you know, and his little, I guess it's a heel turn, I guess his little heel turn. Um, but the way his voice changed when he was making that speech to the fundamentalists and like he just, he, he really shifted. And I was like, okay, I see it now. This is just a little thing, but in the first part, Paul has this vision of him fighting with the Fremen, but they're wearing this like gold weird armor. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And I'm really glad that they didn't pull out that ugly weird gold armor in this film. Cause I was a little worried about that. So that's, but that's like a really weird little, like very tangential thing. Final big change from the books to the movie that I don't mind, but I kind of mind. This is like, it's a little bittersweet is in the books, you know, Paul starts off as a 15 year old and then he, he ends the book as an 18 year old. So it's about two to three years uh, within the books. And so in this movie, they definitely shortened all of that. And I think a lot of that is because of baby Alia. So Jessica's pregnant with Alia, takes the water of life. Baby Alia becomes a reverend mother in the womb and becomes aware in the womb. Like, and not only just like aware, I'm conscious, like aware with like, you know, the awareness of thousands of lifetimes before her, like a fully formed, not even adult, like beyond an adult, you know what I mean? And she's born in the books. She's running around as like a little two, two and a half year old. And uh, you see her in the 1984, played by Alicia DeWitt, and I love weird little creepy baby Alia. I love weird creepy baby Alia. I love her so much. I think she's so weird and wonderful. And, you know, in this, it, but it's tough. Like as a filmmaker, how do you create a believable, creepy, fully aware, two to three year old, like how do you cast that? How do you make that believable on screen to audiences? It's tough, it's really tough. And so they did a little work around where they're like, you know what? We'll just have her in the womb. We're gonna shorten the timeline. We're gonna keep her in the womb and she will be a character that's speaking to Paul from the womb through her mother. There will be, you know, Paul does see her played by Anna Taylor-Joy. That was this big reveal. Uh, she plays Alia, at, who's older, and he sees her in a vision from the future. And I love that. I love the casting as Anna Taylor-Joy as Alia. I'm totally down for it. Uh, I really want to see her in Dune Messiah. I really hope we get a Dune Messiah. It looks like we'll get a Dune Messiah. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but I think that what they did was really smart. I get why they did it. I don't hate it. Although it does kind of... They also have to compress it, not only because of baby Alia, but because they just have to compress the whole story because they're trying to fit so much into this film. But I just, oh, I just wish they had more time. I wish they had more time. I wish this was a show. I'm just gonna keep saying that and I'm sure it's annoying to some people, but like, I don't give a fuck. Like maybe if I say it enough, like I can wish it into being, which is another idea that we will talk about in just a moment. So now let's talk about some of the things that I didn't love about the film and some of the changes that I was like, mm, I don't really agree with that. Uh, I'm a little sad that we didn't get to see Count Fenring. Again, I understand we only have so much time. He's a whole ass new character, but man, I love that weird guy. He's so cool. And I'm sad that we didn't get to see Margot's husband. Uh, Another thing, I love Christopher Walken. He was 
totally miscast. I don't know why they cast him as the emperor. Christopher Walken just plays Christopher Walken. And I don't have hate for that. I love it, but not in this role. I, I feel like we should have cast somebody else. Like I would have loved to see Gary Oldman or Patrick Stewart would have been really good because Patrick Stewart's in the original 1984 film. So it would have been a really cool nod to the 84 film. Like I would have much rather seen so many other people in the role of the Padishah Emperor. I was super bummed that we didn't get any more Mentat stuff. Like Thufir Hawat is totally missing from this film. And I heard that the actor stated that they did film scenes. He filmed scenes with Fade and they're supposed to be like really creepy and like crazy, but they ended up staying on the cutting room floor. Again, I understand it's for time. There's so much stuff you're trying to do. But at the same time, we got Chani's no-name bestie girlfriend who has multiple lines in the movie. I mean, way too much screen time for a fucking unnamed character. I would much rather see Thufir Hawat than that bitch. Like, I don't know who she is. I don't care. Get her out of here. Another thing is I would have loved to see more of Siege Tabra. We just get so little time in there. And what we did see was really cool. I really loved the shit that we saw. I just want to weigh more of it. And the sieges are really cool because they're like all underground in these caves, but they're like mass, like whole cities, like underground cities, essentially. And you have the area where they're making still suits and the areas where they're creating this or that or the other, the weapons area, like here's the sleeping quarters, here's this, here's that. And I just, I, it's so, I don't know. It's just so interesting to me. And I just would have loved to see more of Siege life and what Siege Tabra looks like. Sad we didn't get to see any guild navigators. I ain't gonna lie. I didn't think they were gonna do it. I was like, there, there's no way, it's too weird. They're committed to making this as least weird as they can. And how do you put a little weird fish guy in there? Like a little weird fish guy? Like, you know what I mean? I understand to a degree, but also I think that by not putting in any guild navigators and not really going into the guild at all was a mistake in that for people who haven't read the books, they really don't understand why the spice is so vital and why the spice is so important. Um, it's not spelled out well enough, I feel like. And if you had the Guild Navigators and you had that whole thing, then you'd have to talk more about the spice and how the spice mutated them. And then they use the spice to fold time and space so that people can travel. So it's essentially the gasoline of the Imperium. So that's why it is so important. It's not just a drug that extends life, which also really isn't talked about. It extends your life. Like if you take the spice, like you can live like almost three to four times as long as you normally would. And you never get sick. It's got all these super bennies, except for it's also a poison. And so if you take it too much, you become dependent upon it. And then you have to take it for the rest of your fucking life. And if you don't take it, you'll fucking die. So there's that. But they really just talk about like that it expands your consciousness or something. Like they really like, and, and kind of, they don't even do that very well. So the spice kind of feels like a MacGuffin in this movie, even though it's totally not a MacGuffin and like they just needed to explain it a little bit more. And speaking of the spice, I was sad that we got no spice orgy. Ah. Ah. I mean, again, I, they, they can't do the spice orgy, but I want to see, I'm a pervert. I want to see that spice orgy in the books when Jessica takes the water of life. Not only does she have to take it, she, you know, she transmutes it in her body, but then she's also able to like transmute it kind of in her spit and like create this kind of like little deal where she spits it back into the little bottle. And then that creates this chain reaction. And then it makes it to where everybody can take this water of life. It like nullifies it as a poison. And so then all the Fremen's take it and then they all get naked and they all have a crazy fun orgy because their lives are so fucking hard. It's so fucking tough that like, it's like, let them have a spice orgy every now and again, okay? Like life's hard, let loose, have a spice orgy. And within that spice orgy, like, and everybody's tripping balls, mind you. It's like, they're not just like, oh, like, uh, they're, they're just, it's not, they're not just horny, they're tripping balls while they're horny. 
And in the book, there's a scene where like Paul and Chani, like they're just kind of getting to know each other, but they're both tripping balls on this fucking spice orgy shit. And like Chani like sees like their unborn child, like from the future, like in her hand. It's just like, whoa, like there's so much cool shit. And I was just like, ah, oh, I'm so, I, I want to see that so bad, but that's me personally as a book reader and a pervert. Um, and also just in general, I was a bit disappointed with the water of life scenes where Jessica took the water of life and Paul took the water of life. I would have loved to see more, make it more mystical, you know, like make it, I mean, they kind of did it, but they kind of, they kind of like, I feel like they gloss over it. Like, I feel like they're a little embarrassed about it. And it's like, no, 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 get in there. Like make it weird. Like I want to know more. And I, and I feel like they also didn't really explain other memory and how that works. And I would have loved to see more scenes of other memory, like Jessica, not just talking to Alia, but Jessica maybe conferring with her other memory of all of the women who came before her and all the Reverend mothers, the Fremen Reverend mothers that, you know, she got from the other, uh, the other Fremen, the Fremen Reverend mother. And that's another thing too. I was like the, the, the other Reverend mother just kind of like passes out and dies. Like they never like touch like foreheads. And in the book, like there's a thing, like if you're dying and you're trying to give your memories to another Bene Gesserit, you like, you have to touch foreheads. And I was like, oh, I don't want to see them touch foreheads, but that's a little, that's like, that's me being nitpicky and weird. Let's see here. Let's see here. What else? What else? I feel like the third act was rushed, needed more time again. I mean, that's my main complaint. It just needs more time, more room to breathe. The third act really like, it just starts going and I'm not really sure like Paul's switch from, I don't want to be the Lizan al Gaib to like being like, okay, I'll do it. I'm doing it. I'm evil now. Like. I just felt like it was a little clunky. And also then at the end, this is another big change is, is in the book, they recognize Paul's right. They're like, oh yeah, you're the emperor. You could kill the spice production. So you, you're the emperor now, it's fine, bro. And in the movie, the lands rat is like, no, you have to fight us for it. And so the Fremens are like, all right, let's go, motherfuckers. And they're like immediately boarding the ships. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You wouldn't immediately board, fuck. You don't have your supplies ready. You're not ready to go to war. Where do these warships come from? Like, you need a minute to like figure it out. And then you get on the ships, um, which I thought I was like a little silly, but whatever. Um, but, you know, again, it just needs to be a show. Another thing, and this is something I talked about with Dune 1, is I really don't like... Rebecca Ferguson's portrayal of Lady Jessica. And maybe it's Denise directing of her. Maybe it's her take. I don't know. I don't know. But I feel like Lady Jessica is uh, portrayed as a very like weak character when in the book she's like, dude, she's like the strongest bitch ever. And she's been a Jesuit. She's got emotional control. She's got control over her body. Like, not to say she never cries, but like, God damn, that bitch is crying so much in the first movie, I hate it. And in this film, I was so mad when she threw up. I was so mad. And it's implied that she's throwing up because she's disgusted because the Fremen are taking the water from the, the corpses. And a Bene Gesserit would never be faced by that. And a Bene Gesserit would never throw up if she, um, she, she wouldn't throw up like that. Like she wouldn't throw up in a place where she wasn't able to throw up at. Like she'd be able to control her body, I feel like. And then some people were like, no, it's cause she's pregnant and it's morning sickness. And that's really what it is. I don't buy it. I don't think so. You know, I don't like that either. She'd still be able to control it. She'd still be able to control it. But after Lady Jessica took the water of life, uh, she became more psychotic than she is, seemingly psychotic than she is in the book. Like. She just becomes like super fucking wise and like, but also like, I don't know, very formidable. And she's very formidable in this. Um, but I think I recognized her a lot more after she took the water of life. I was like, okay, okay. I recognize this lady a little bit more. She isn't exactly how she is in the books, but like, I like her a lot better. But I think Re Rebecca Ferguson is, is gorgeous. I think she's a wonderful actress. Uh, I'm just not stoked on their portrayal of her character in particular, which is so odd because they're like, oh, we're trying to empower all these female characters in Dune and we're gonna make them, um, you know, we're gonna make Chani and Irulan and, you know, they're gonna be more badass than they are in the books, but then they make the, the, the most badass chick in the book, like less badass, which I'm like, I, I don't, I don't understand that. So now let's get to my biggest complaint 
of my review, Zendaya as Chani. I don't like her as Chani. I didn't like her in the first part and I don't like her in the second part. My feeling has not changed about that. I don't like her little attitude. I don't like her little water fat face. She's got a beautiful face. I'm not saying she's ugly. I'm not saying she's fat, but like in, in like Arrakis terms, like you get, like you look water fat, outworlder. And she's got a little water fat face. I'm just like, I don't buy her. I don't buy her as a fucking Fedaikin, which I say Fede Keen. I like Fede Keen better. I don't buy it with her perfectly laid eyebrows that she's some fucking super badass. Like I, I just, bleh. I, if I was gonna recast her, I would possibly recast her with Sasha Kaye, who played Supergirl in the Flash movie. I haven't seen enough of that girl's work, but I feel like Sasha Kaye. I also kind of have a crush on her as Supergirl, so maybe that's just like, <laughs> again, me being a pervert talking, <laughs> but like, woo, she was so hot. And like, I think, I don't like Zendaya in this. And she has no chemistry with Timothy Chalamet. Those two, I don't buy it. I don't buy them as lovers. I don't see it. I don't feel it. Blah. And on top of all of that, I'm not a big fan of what they did with her character arc. That is another huge shift from the book to the movie. And specifically, that last scene that last shot in the film. I fucking hate it. I hate her little squishy, little mad face. And I don't know, like, <sighs> and this is because I'm a book reader. And so those of you who aren't book readers and you haven't also read like Messiah, like not only have I read Dune, but I've also read Dune Messiah. And so I know that whatever this is, cause now she's seemingly poised to be someone who is going to bring Paul down if they do a third movie. And it definitely feels like they're setting up a third movie here, okay? Like they wanna do that third movie. And Villeneuve has said that he wants to do it, but he wants to do it in a few years, let everybody get a little bit older because time passes between Dune and Dune Messiah. And I think that's a great fucking plan. I love that plan, I'm super in on it. I wanna see him a Dune Messiah. I'm totally in it, in for that. Um, but that, that notion that she could possibly be the one who's going to like help take him down and that she's kind of like his foil now that totally changes like Dune Messiah, like radically changes Dune Messiah. And so I'm just, I'm not sure how that's going to work. And this feeds also into like another big change from the book to the movie is in the book, the Fremen are like, they, they have such a hard life that they all have to be on the same fucking page. Like you can't have splits in your ideology, in your religion. Like everybody's like, we're on the same page. We believe the same things. We all adhere to the same law, which there's something, I don't know, being from America where everybody's so different and everybody's fighting all the fucking time, which that's part of our strength, but it's also part of our weakness. And I see, you know, the positive sides of having a, a very diverse, uh, different people with different beliefs from different cultures, like, and that's part of what makes America so great. But it's also part of what makes America so frustrating and like it, it has a dark side to it as well. And so one of the things that I love about the Fremen is that they're like, they are monocultural and they all believe the same thing and they all work together and they get shit done together. And I just like, I think that's so hot. Like, I just like think that's so cool about them. But in this film, it's different. So you have the Southern fundamentalists, the, the Fremen who live in the Southern polar regions, and they are the believers, and they believe in this prophecy of the Gizan al-Gaib of the Mahdi, 
And then you have these northern Fremen who, I guess they're a little bit more cosmopolitan because they're closer to the cities or something. I think that's kind of what's, <laughs> what's implied. Uh, and they also are all like personified by younger people. Like, you, like all the people who are like, I don't believe in that shit. Like they're all younger Fremen seemingly. I mean, I could be wrong. Again, I need to see the film another time. So like I've only seen this film once, so I could be wrong here. And so, you know, because you have these two different factions of people who believe two different things, some people are like totally down with Paul. Some people are totally against that. Chani is in the camp of, I'm a skeptic. I don't believe any of that shit. That's religious hooey. That's how we are enslaved. Like people like are using this to uh, manipulate us and she's not wrong. And I understand why you don't want to paint the Fremen as gullible fools who are easily manipulated. Like, I, I, I get it because they're not. And that's the thing too, is like in the book, I never took them for that. But in the current climate, political climate, and with all the discourse going on currently, it would definitely be taken that way. And it would definitely be viewed in like, oh, you're just trying to make native people who are like being colonized look like fucking idiots and that's not cool. And so, so I get it, I get it. Um, and I also believe that art should reflect that the times that it's born out of. And this, uh, this split that you're seeing is definitely something that I see in our current society, for sure. You have the older generations who are more conservative and tend to be more religious. Uh, you know, and then you have the younger generations who tend to be more liberal and less uh, less religious, less into that whole thing. And Chani is the avatar for that, the avatar for today's younger generation who are atheistic and philosophical materialists uh, and by materialist I don't mean people who are just want to buy stuff all the time like I'm not talking about that type of materialist I'm talking about a materialist who only believes in the physical world like they don't believe in a spiritual world necessarily like they don't they don't adhere to that they're only like believe what's right in front of them uh, and so that's, that's kind of, you know, most, most atheists would have to be materialists, whatever. And I don't know, this whole thing has just really got me thinking. Like, and that's why I love art. And that's why I love watching movies. And that's something that I love about this film is that it's really getting me to think about things, you know, much like Oppenheimer, much like the Barbie movie. I'm like thinking about like this whole issue that not only that the Fremen are dealing with, but that we're dealing with in our own society. And... It's interesting to me because like I also, like me personally, as someone who is a student of the occult and somebody who like, I am a, I'm a spiritualist. Um, although I don't know, I don't wanna put a label on myself, but I'm definitely not an atheistic materialist, okay? Like I believe in beyond, like there's weird shit that we fucking can't explain. And like, there's like, I feel like there are higher powers and like other things out there. I don't wanna put a label on it. Because whatever it is, I can't quantify it with my little monkey human brain. And for materialists, it's like reality is very cut and dry. And for me, I believe that reality is plastic. I believe that our beliefs shape our reality and like, and have an effect on reality. It's not just reality has an effect on us. And there's that whole saying, be careful what you wish for. You know, be careful what you wish for. And what does that mean? Well, it means that if you want something for long enough and you keep wishing for it, eventually it might happen, but it's never gonna happen the way you want it to happen. And it may come about in ways that you're like not excited about or in ways that, uh, I don't know, can be a bummer. And there's also the saying, fake it till you make it. So if you, pretend to be something for long enough, you can become that thing. So these are ideas, like these have to do with the reality is plastic ideas. And so the prophecy 
was indeed planted by the Bene Gesserit through their Missionaria Tec Protectiva, which uh, is like a little protocol where they go around to all these planets, they seed these planets with like religious engineering so that if a Bene Gesserit is ever stranded on one of these planets, they can like use these, uh, this religious engineering to protect themselves. That's what it is. And so, Yes, the prophecy was planted by the Bene Gesserit, but maybe the Fremen wished so hard for their Lisan al Gaib that it finally came true. I mean, if you think about it, Paul is fulfilling all of the requirements, regardless of whether this is a false prophecy or a true prophecy or whatever. This guy is the universe's fucking super being. He's a quiz at Saderach. There is magic in that. And see through space and time? If that's not a fucking Messiah prophet, Lisa and Al Gaib, I don't know what the fuck it like. What more do you want, Chani? And here's the thing Chani's been wishing. She's been wishing for her people to be free, okay? But be careful what you wish for because now they are, but it's not in the way you wanted it to happen. But it's like, well, you got it. You got it. And not only are you guys free from Harkonnen tyranny, you're poised to be at the top of the hierarchy and rule the fucking Imperium. What more do you want? What more do you want? You gonna be mad about that? I mean, I understand her being mad about the, the Irulan thing and, oh, she's gonna take his hand in marriage. But again, in the books, Duke Leto, okay, he had a concubine, Lady Jessica, always wanted to marry her, couldn't kept his hand in marriage free just in case he could get a cool political alliance, regrets it, dies regretting it. His son is dealing, like inherits his father's karma and Paul has to keep Chani as a concubine, but does use the fucking political alliance. But the thing is, is that he never touches Irulan and he makes that very clear to everybody. He's like, this is a political marriage. I'm not gonna fuck that bitch. I'm not gonna touch her. Chani's my concubine. She's gonna be, she's gonna have my children and her children are gonna be the heir to my throne. So in the book, you know, Chani, Chani makes out. She does, she does great. It's fine. You're not cheating on her. It's fine. Um, even though it's annoying, it's like, she's not like fucked over where she's just like, oh, I guess I'll just, I guess I'm just gonna get fucked and who cares about me? It's not like that at all. He does care about her. And so that isn't obviously explained in this one and then Chani gets mad and then she leaves. But she leaves because A, she's mad about that, but B, because she's also like, oh, he's not the Mahdi. That's fake, that's bullshit. He's just manipulating my people, blah, 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 blah. But again, it's just like, well, do the ends justify the means? Do you wanna be free or not? This is the only chance you have, ho. What's the problem? <laughs> I don't know. It's it's a lot. It's a lot. I don't know if I'm saying this. This one's this one this one's so frustrated. It's because I know I could say this much better if I had a few weeks to think about it. Because it's coming out all garbled right now. And this is why I hate YouTube culture. You just gotta spit it out as fast as you can, and it's frustrating. Because if I had more time and I could watch the movie a few more times and I had a few like a month to chew on it, I could come up with a really succinct way to say all this that doesn't sound all over the place and like I'm a crazy person. <laughs> But I don't have that kind of time, and neither do you, apparently. So, um, so whatever. What are you gonna do about it? You're gonna end your review is what you're gonna do about it. And I just want to thank all of you guys for watching my review today. Again, please go see Dune Part Two. Uh, I really enjoyed it, regardless of all my little nitpicky bullshit. And the thing that I love the most about these Dune movies is that it is getting people around the world to finally pick up that fucking book and read it. And hopefully, if they're an OG Fremen warrior, they will continue and read the other books too. Uh, a lot of people give up after the first, a lot of people give up not even finishing the first one. But that's my favorite thing about these movies is regardless of how successful I feel like they are for me and entertaining my silly ass, I'm just so grateful that it's getting people to pick up that fucking book because I love Dune. I love Dune. I've, I love Dune so much. 
<laughs> I want you fucks to read these fucking books. <laughs> read these fucking books. And if you're interested in reading this book, uh, these books, and you're, but you, you're like, oh, this is kind of tough, you know, this is, because it's a lot. It's a dense book. A lot of people give up, like I said. I've got Dune Clubs for you. Just look below their shelves. There's Dune Clubs for every single fucking Dune book out there. So if you're struggling, I will help get you through the sands of Arrakis. I'm there for you. I love you. I love these books. I love Frank Herbert. I love Denny Villeneuve. I love everybody involved with this project. You guys did such a great job. Thank you guys all for showing up and showing out for us. Uh, theater goers. Thank you for making a movie that's just like perfect for the theater and a movie going experience. I just, I really appreciate it. And I love all of you guys out there. I love you too for showing up and watching my review and supporting me over the years. I'm so excited. Uh, I do have some updates on Akira the documentary. I am making my first full length feature film. And, you know, I've got my investor agreement done. I got it signed. I'm working on getting all of the merch stuff done for those of you who uh, contributed to the Kickstarter. And for uh, and also, I've recently uh, I've recently hired a director of photography, uh, Brenton. I'm very excited to work with him as well. So things are moving over here. Uh, and yeah, what other updates do I have? Oh, and also too, I would love to invite you guys to come watch movies with me every Saturday on Twitch.tv slash Danica XIX at 3:30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, although this coming Saturday, I'm going to be out of town, but most Saturdays we are watching movies together, all bangers all year. Uh, we have so much fun. So we watched Starship Troopers recently. That was just fantastic. I had so much fun and don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel, ring that bell and leave a comment below. How did you feel about Dune part two? How do you feel about Dune part one and part two? How do you feel about the changes? Uh, what do you like? What do you not like? Holla at your girl. Let me know in the comments. Start a fight. I'll, I don't care. I'll be there reading all of them. <laughs> Say something mean, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to be there. I'm going to read your comments. So uh, thank you again. I love you all. And I will see you when I see you.